Hello everyone, I'm Stephen Sempel, I'm an ordained reverend for the Universal Life Church. I have a doctorate in divinity, doctorate in ministry, doctorate in humanitarianism, all honorary of course, and I'm honorary professor of theology. Today on April 11th is another supposed Q&A day of directed protest slash violence. Like previous sermons, liturgies concerning these days of supposed violence, I will be giving a sermon slash liturgy. God is not on the side of the nationalists, domestic terrorists, xenophobes, or racists, because they are not of love. They fail imaginings deo in God's image, as well as every tenet and testament of Christ. For God so loved the world that gave his only begotten Son, that who should ever believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. God is not with these people, who are so subsumed by their own hatred that, knowingly or otherwise, they are being used by Lucifer to enact violence and worse. Lucifer, as irrevocably proven, uses those of hatred in their hearts to do unspeakable evils. These beings of hatred, people who are completely subsumed by their own hatred slash bigotry, that they are controlled by it subconsciously or consciously. Many of them, at one point, were truly Christians and people of God and good, more of love. However, they listened to fear-mongering, hate-mongering, or preached hatred by perpetrators of false doctrines, like the one saved, always saved, and false prophecies, and were indoctrinated, and were overcome by their own fear and hatred, and no longer have empathy for their fellow men. It is that lack of love, the lack of empathy for others, that makes them solely not of Christ nor God, and they are subsequently not Christians and can't be considered Christians, officially or otherwise, until they no longer are of hatred and xenophobia and both repent and attempt. And that is my official standing on as an ordained reverend, by the way, and a theologian. Here is a good scripture on love and what it actually naturality is, especially as we as Christians are supposed to be of. If I were to speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have no love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind, love does not envy or boast, it is not arrogant or rude, it does not insist in its own way, it is not irritable or resentful, it does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things, love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away, as for tongues, they will cease, as for knowledge, it will pass away, for we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, a partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in the mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. And that's from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13, and this is from the English Standardized Version. Here is an excerpt from How to Overcome Evil Leadership with Good, which of course applies to overcoming slash confronting evil in general, especially as a Christian. First, we must recognize our own capacity for evil. In Matthew 15, Jesus explains to the disciples that out of the heart comes evil thoughts, murder, adultery, sexual immorality, theft, false witness, slander. Jeremiah 17.9 adds that the heart is deceitful above all things. The disposition and habit of repentance is one we need to cultivate daily as followers of Christ, aka bring our sins to God on the daily and ask for forgiveness and repent and atone for us. Which of course is something that the uh, once saved, all is saved false doctrine specifically teaches against, which of course makes that a false doctrine subsequently. Second, we must counter evil with good. Romans 12.21 commands us, do not overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. As we seek to follow Christ by serving others, we are overcoming evil with good. As choose to love and forgive and seek reconciliation, we are overcoming evil with good. Even the most seemingly insignificant act of kindness and love is an act of courage. Third, we must take the hard steps to confront the evil we see around us. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, one of our great Christian heroes, reminds us that we cannot retreat into lives of private virtuousness. Instead, we must find the strength to confront evil by single-minded devotion to Jesus. 
To be simple is to fix one's eyes solely on the simple truth of God at a time when all concepts are being confused, distorted, and turned upside down. Fourth, we must trust in God and his work of reconciliation, even when we see so much around that discourages us. Bonhoff leaves us with a word of tremendous hope as we seek to live courageously as Christian leaders. In him, Jesus, the world was reconciled with God. It is not by its overthrowing, but by its reconciliation that the world is subdued. It is not by ideas and programs or by conscious duty, responsibility, and virtue that reality can be confronted and overcome, but simply and solely by the perfect love of God. Here, again, it is not by a general idea of love that this is achieved, but by the really lived love of God in Jesus Christ. This love of God does not withdraw from reality into noble souls secluded from the world. It experiences and suffers the reality of the world in all its hearts. And that's from Confronting Evil Leadership, and the link is in the description, by the way. A very good read, by the way. Here are some quotes from Dietrich Bonhoeffer which apply. We shall be judged according to our works. This is why we are exhorted to do good works. The Bible assuredly knows nothing of those qualms and about good works, by which we only try to excuse ourselves and justify our evil works. The Bible never draws the antithesis between faith and good works so sharply as to maintain that good works undermines faith. No, it is evil works rather than good works which hinder and destroy faith. Grace and active obedience are complementary. There is no faith without good works and no good works apart from faith. And that's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, The Cost of Discipleship. Things are much simpler here than we like. Not that we do not know God's commandments, but that we do not do them. And then gradually, as a consequence of such disobedience, we no longer know what is right. That is our predicament. And that's certainly been the case the past four years, certainly. And more. Because, again, they fell because of their hatred, their bigotry. Fell to that fear-mongering and became not of Christ, subsequently. <clears throat> Christ did not, like an ethicist, love a theory about the good. He loved real people. Christ was not interested, like a philosopher, in what is generally valid, but in that which serves real, concrete human beings. Christ was not concerned about whether the maxim of an action could become a principle of universal law, but whether my action now helps my neighbor to be a human being before God. God did not become an idea, a principle, a program, a universally valid belief, or a law. God became human. And that's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Ethics. And in the incarnation, the whole human race recovers the dignity of the image of God. Henceforth, any attack, even on the least of men, is an attack on Christ, who took the form of man, and in his own person restored the image of God in all that bears a human form. Through fellowship and communion with the Incarnate Lord, we recover our true humanity, and at the same time we are delivered from that individualism, which is a consequence of sin, and retrieve our solidarity with the whole human race. By being partakers of Christ Incarnate, we are partakers in the whole humanity which he bore. Now we know that we have been taken up and born in the humanity of Jesus, and therefore that new nature we now enjoy means that we too must bear the sins and sorrows of others. The Incarnate Lord makes his followers the brothers of all mankind. Okay, we as Christians are supposed to help others regardless. And that's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, The Cost of Discipleship. In the New Testament, our enemies are those who harbor hostility against us, not those against whom we cherish hostility, for Jesus refuses to reckon with such a possibility. The Christian must treat his enemy as a brother and requite his hostility with love. His behavior must be determined, not by the way others treat him, but by the treatment he himself receives from Jesus. It has only one source, and that is the will of Jesus. And that's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, The Cost of Discipleship. Christian love draws no distinction between one enemy and another, except that the more bitter our enemy's hatred, the greater his need of love. Be his enmity political or religious, he has nothing to expect from a follower of Jesus but unqualified love. In such love, there is no, not inner discord between the private person and the official capacity. In both, we are disciples of Christ, or we are not Christians at all. And that's from Dietrich 
Bonhoeffer the cost of discipleship. In other times, it may have been the business of Christianity to champion the equality of all men. Its business today will be to defend passionately human dignity and reserve, aka human rights. And that's from Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Letters and Papers from Prison. 